welcome this morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our coffee break here with Scott Island Alliance. Um, as folks are joining, uh, I'm hoping that um, you all will let us know where you're tuning in from. So go ahead and put in the chat if you are joining us from somewhere across the Sky Island region or outside of it. We'd love to know where you're coming from. Uh, I'm speaking today from Tucson, Arizona, where the Sky Island Alliance office is based on the traditional lands of the Dona Aldam and Pasquayaki, as well as other indigenous peoples. Uh, we have Gail joining us from Green Valley. Sue from Buffalo, New York. That is way out there. That's great. Welcome. Welcome to this little snapshot of the Sky Island region. Oro Valley. All right. Very nice. We have a couple of folks still joining, so we're going to give it another minute or two. Uh, I'm really excited here. I feel like we are just entering the time of year in Tucson where uh, we're getting to think about the monsoon and getting excited about that, even though it's still a couple months away. It's my favorite time of year here in the Sky Island region. All right, welcome everybody. Yeah, if you'd like more details on our land acknowledgement, please go ahead and read the link that Emily just put in the chat. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, Emily, um, as well as, of course, our speaker, who I'll introduce in a moment. Joining us from Phoenix, welcome, Barry. So yeah, go ahead and let us know where you're joining us from this morning. Type it in the chat. We're, we're so excited to have you here with us today. All right, we'll just give it one more minute for folks to join, and then I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. So thank you very much for joining us today. All right, folks from Sierra Vista, from Cochise, we are all over the Sky Island region already today. I'm excited. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, so I am delighted to introduce our speaker for today, John Pelletier. John has worked as a professor in the Geosciences Department at the University of Arizona since 1999. He investigates landform evolution and natural hazards associated with Earth's surface, such as flooding, landslides, and severe soil erosion. His primary interest for the past several years has been working with mining companies to reclaim formerly mined areas so that as little waste as possible is released into the environment. John will be speaking to us today about the geology and geomorphology of the Sky Islands. So basically, how did the mountains get here? How did they end up here? And what are the geological processes that shaped them? So this is, of course, super important, the underlying geology for all of the wonderful biodiversity that we work on here. And I'm really looking forward to this talk. Um, as a reminder, during the talk, we'd like you to remain muted and uh, please use the chat to type in any of your questions. At the end, we'll have time to address those. So please do use that chat feature. We're really excited to hear your questions on these topics. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to John. Welcome. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak today. So um, Sky Islands are Sky Islands in part because they're at high elevation. And so today I'd like to talk about, I'd like to start the talk by talking about how elevation differences come to be uh, and what some of the processes that are involved in that elevation difference creation is in the skylands of Southern Arizona and also in the basin and range more generally. So the story begins at uh, about 40 million years ago. And so the left panel shows the, the plate tectonic situation that was occurring at that time. And that contrasts with the, this, um, what's happening today, which is shown over in the right. So in the left, around 40 million years ago, there was an oceanic plate called the Farallon Plate that was being shoved underneath the North American Plate, which is made up of continental crust. And that convergence of two tectonic plates did two things. First of all, it created high topography in Western North America. And so, for example, this cartoon shows a chain of, of, of volcanoes similar to the modern day Cascade Range. And it also created a compressive force. And that compressive force is one of the reasons why the topography is able to maintain a high elevation at this time. In fact, in, in Nevada, uh, this time, 40 million years ago, the landscape was referred to as the Nevada Plano. And that's analogous to the modern day Andean Altiplano in the, the, the Southern Cordillera uh, down in, in South America. Um, so things happened between 40 million years ago and today. Uh, there's been changes in, in the plate tectonic uh, uh, environment essentially due to changes in, in mantle convection, which ultimately is driving how the plates are moving around. And 
Um, one of the things that's happened is that this Farallon plate is no longer being shoved underneath North America. We have a San Andreas Fault, which is a transform boundary primarily uh, along the Pacific coast. And what that's done is it's removed the compressive force that kept the topography high in the Western United States. And that has created a zone shown here in the right um, in gray that, this, that, that is the basin range. So the basin and range province is one that has been tectonically extended over the last 40 million years to its present day configuration. And a big reason why is the loss of that, that pressure that was holding up the, uh, the high topography associated with the, with the subduction of the Farallon plate. So between about 35 million years ago and 25 million years ago in Southern Arizona, uh, this extension process took place that was ultimately a consequence of the plate tectonic reorganization that I just described. And I just wanna talk a little bit more about, uh, about this process. We call this gravitational collapse. And the idea is that when the topography is, has a pressure force on both sides, one force being the subduction of the Farallon plate, it's able to keep this topography at high elevation. So something analogous to the modern day Andes, which is, has an altiplano at about five kilometers above sea level. And when you remove that pressure force from the edge, from the west, then the topography can gravitationally collapse. And that, that phrase gravitational collapse basically is invoking the idea that if you don't have a pressure force keeping this topography up high and, and you know, compressed together, then the internal forces of pressure can cause the topography to flow outward and collapse by the force of gravity. So you need that pressure force to be maintained and without it, and this, this process of removal of that pressure occurred between about 35 million years and 25 million years ago, then the lower crust can flow. The lower crust is not a liquid, but it can flow because it undergoes solid state creep, which is a process of the reorganization of individual mineral grains and the, the, the defects between them or among them that can cause over geologic time, so tens of millions of years, the lower crust can flow as a result of this gravitational collapse process. Now, what happens at the surface, the rocks are brittle at the surface, and so they don't flow, the upper crust is brittle, and you develop normal faults. And that creates an alternating series of ranges and basins and ranges and basins. And they're separated by about 20 kilometers, something like that. And so that basin and range style of landscapes is what we have here in Southern Arizona. And of course the ranges make up the, the sky islands. Zooming in a little bit more now at a, the scale of an individual mountain front, what I'm showing here is uh, a single normal fault, okay? And it, it has what we call a hanging wall, which sits or hangs on top of the fault. And that's comprised primarily of sedimentary rocks. And deeper down on the footwall side of the, of the normal fault, we have metamorphic rocks. And so metamorphic rocks are deeper. Sedimentary rocks are formed by the deposition of sediments near the surface. And so they accumulate over time, right? And the metamorphic rocks are from older, deeper processes associated with heating and high pressure that you only get at great depths. So when this gravitational process gravitational collapse process begins, you get slip along the normal fault, which is shown here. That's essentially the difference between the upper image and the lower image is this slip that accumulates over time. So what that does geologically is that it exposes the deep metamorphic rocks. And in places like the Catalina Mountains and the Rincons and the Pinaleños, we have rocks that are like granite in composition, but they've been sheared and metamorphosed to become what we call nice, nice with a G. And uh, we also have other names for them. Basically they're, they're nisic rocks. And these are metamorphic rocks that are brought, brought up from 10 or 20 kilometers in the crust. They're deep, they start off deep and they're brought up with a lot of this extension to what we see at the surface. Now on the other side of the mountain front, you have sedimentary rocks, and this also creates what we call accommodation space. This is just space when the bottom drops out, you then have space for the deposition of younger sediments on top. And so a lot of the, 
basin fill sediments that come into the Tucson basin and other basins are sediments that are derived from the erosion of the mountain belt. And they just, they dump down in, you know, on top of these sedimentary rocks. So geologically, normal faults involve the exposure of deep metamorphic rocks and uh, in, the, in, the, in the mountain ranges, and they involve the burial of shallow sedimentary rocks, which can be seen here and there along the edges of, of the basin. But down in the deepest portion of the basin, you have kilometers of sediment that cover up, and so we don't see these, these sedimentary rocks anymore. One of the things I want to emphasize, um, not at the moment, but in a few minutes, is the fact that uh, this extension process that exposes the mountains and exposes the metamorphic rocks is associated with both an extensional force that is ultimately related to the removal of pressure associated with the Farallon plate, but also a compressive force. And the combination of extensional forces or tensile forces together with compressive forces gives rise to fractures and other zones of weaknesses within the mountain belt that can be exploited by rivers. And so I wanna talk as we transition from geology into geomorphology, I'm gonna talk about how the orientations of rivers can be controlled by the fracture network, which is related or shown schematically here by this, this mesh network. Before I talk about the, the, the orientations of rivers, I wanna talk a little bit more about these, this process of elevation differences and how they're created over time. So this is a schematic image on the top of what these normal fault bounded blocks might look like. So basically this is the simplest representation of trapezoids that point up and trapezoids that point down. And uh, the situation is, bit more complex than that. But this is basically the simplest case where you have two normal faults on either side. And as this extension plays out, what happens is you have, um, you have the rising of, of, the, of the mountain block that has a trapezoid pointed up, and you have the falling, excuse me, the falling of the trapezoid that's pointed down. And one of the reasons for that process that relates to this elevation difference over time is, has to do with buoyancy. So buoyancy is basically the process or it's a, it's a force that's related to density differences in a gravitational field. So we have crustal material, which is less dense than the mantle material beneath it. The crust is about 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter, and the mantle is about 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter. And so when you have a crustal block like this, it's been broken up, it becomes somewhat decoupled from its neighbor, and it can rise and fall somewhat independently. So this trapezoidal block that's pointed up, it has a big wide base. And this big wide base is basically low density material that's displacing higher density material, this mantle material. This is analogous to a soccer ball that sits in water. So a soccer ball that sits in water is, has air and a little bit of rubber that's displacing the, the, the water in this case, in this analogy, and it's higher density. So as long as there's a density difference between what's displacing the higher density material, then you get an upward force on this ball. So if you've ever been to the beach and you've taken a beach ball and tried to shove it underneath water, it's kind of hard to do. It's because of that buoyancy force. So crust uh, displacing mantle has the same type of buoyancy. So here I'm just trying to show that the shape of the block plays a role that you know if, if you extend this terrain, it's not totally obvious that this block would want to go up to create a mountain range and that the neighboring block would want to go down to create a basin. But buoyancy plays a role in part because of the shape of this, this crustal root is what we call it. It's basically big and wide here, so there's more buoyancy associated with this block. This is a narrow zone of buoyancy. Uh, it's a narrow zone of crustal material, and so it's going to tend to sink as a result. So the Sky Island is created through the extension process through the removal of that pressure force. And also buoyancy plays another role once this process gets started and it causes certain shape blocks to go up and other shape blocks to go down. So I wanna come back to this, this slide here and just focus a little bit more on the issue of 
of what's happening during the, uh, the, the, the exhumation and the exposure of these metamorphic rocks. So there are pressure forces uh, there that are being exerted on the rock as they come up. This is a violent process. It happens over slowly over time, but there's a lot of pressure involved. And so the extension basically creates fractures that are perpendicular to the extension direction. And the extension is about 30 degrees south of west in this part of the world. And that's, that's, that's true throughout this entire time period from 35 million years, 25 million years, when these sky islands were created. There was a pull apart or an extensional force that was, that was, that was exerted on the rocks that was, that was along a line um, that extends from basically down towards um, Cells, Arizona, you know, or Y, Arizona, down towards the Sea of Cortez, and up towards, um, you know, the Four Corners region, something like that. Um, my geography is a little, little off on that, but basically just trying to give you a sense that uh, Tucson was being pulled apart in a direction that on one side was like basically the Colorado Delta, and on the other side was maybe the White Mountains, something like, something like that. And at the same time that this tensile force was active, rocks will deform in such a way they don't want to change their, their volume. They will respond elastically to resist that. So what that means is that at the same time, this tensile force is being exerted on the rock. There's also a compressive force that is effectively always in operation in the opposite direction, in the perpendicular direction. So if you try to pull a rock apart, there is always just because of the elasticity of the rock, a compressive force that's acting in the opposite direction to sort of push it together. What that means is that when you create, um, when you pull this rock apart, you do a couple of things. Um, you exert uh, two perpendicular forces on the rock. One is tensile and the other one is compressive. And that creates a series of fractures, which we call joints in the bedrock that can be exploited by landscape forming processes. Um, so I'll talk a bit about those joints in just a minute. <clears throat> but another thing that happens is that some of this compressive force can cause the rock to fold at a variety of wavelengths. And the biggest wavelength that we see is actually associated with the individual antiforms or like these folded structures that make up individual ridges. So this is Tankaverde Ridge here. This is, you know, the main uh, the main topographic feature of the Rincon Mountains. And as you go towards the southeast, there's another antiform. And then the Catalina Mountains themselves are yet another. So basically, I'm just zooming in on Tankaverde Ridge, which is one particular ridge among at least three that make up this Catalina Rincon complex. And so each of these forms is created by the fact that there's compressive forces that are causing the rocks to fold upward in a, in a geometry that one of the things it does is it creates this, this waviness to the fault itself. So the fault is the transition zone between the metamorphic rocks and the sedimentary rocks. It's basically this yellow line. And it's not a straight line in part because of this compressive force that I'm trying to emphasize here. And that compressive force creates fractures at small scales, and it also creates a waviness and a both in, in, in elevation and a waviness also to the shape of the, um, of the fault, the normal fault in, in map view. So this is just some of the heterogeneity that we see and how it's related to some of the forces that are at play here. <clears throat> so one of the things that we see that has been noted for a long time is the fact that the river channels tend to become oriented both parallel to and perpendicular to this extension direction, which again is about 30 degrees south of west. And so I'm gonna call this west-southwest. Um, what we're doing is we're looking up Tankaverde Ridge towards Micah Mountain directly along that zone of, or that direction of extension. So the compression that results from the fact that the rock behaves elastically, that compression is going to be 90 degrees with respect to the direction of extension. And what that does is it creates, uh, through processes that we don't fully understand, but I'll, I'll speculate on what some of them are, it creates um, zones of weakness that can be exploited by um, geomorphic processes. And ge by geomorphic processes, I just mean water flowing in streams, 
and that water is able to carve down into the rock. It's also carrying rock in, in sediment transport. And so the rock on rock contact can create abrasion and can break down rock over long geologic time scales as well. So if you have a rock that's highly heterogeneous, then those river channels can become oriented along zones of weakness. And it turns out that in many of the Sky Islands, those zones of weakness are parallel to and perpendicular to this extension direction, which is the same all around Southern Arizona. It's this west-southwest direction. So this is a particularly good example here in the Rincon Mountains, but we see similar examples too. You see um, Sabino Canyon, for example, uh, coming out of the Catalina Mountains. And then as it gets towards the mountain front, it takes a turn very much in this west-southwest direction. And that's because of um, so something's happening to, to align these fluvial channels preferentially along that direction. So I'm going to speculate, and there's some evidence behind this too, that there are a couple of mechanisms that contribute to preferential channel alignment parallel and perpendicular to this extension direction. Um, one of them is the exploitation, and I apologize if that's not a great word, but it's the best word that is the word that I could come up with um, on short notice, uh, the exploitation of vertically oriented joints, and also the exploitation of more erodible metamorphic bands that can be exposed with some vertical component through the tilting of the rocks. So that's a, that's a lot of words, but I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. And basically the overarching idea is that there are zones of weakness in this heterogeneous rock that the water and the sediment being carried by the water can take advantage of in order to erode more rapidly uh, in certain places and in certain directions that cause the river channels to become preferentially oriented along those directions. So I'll start off with the joint story. Basically, the joints um, in the Catalinas look something like this. So this is an individual river channel. This is uh, Soldier Canyon. This is just downstream from the Gordon Harabayashi Trail or that campground that you might be familiar with up in the Catalinas. And these are, these are fractures that develop in the rock system. This is Ann Uberg for scale. And these fractures develop vertically because the extensional com and compressive forces are primarily in the horizontal direction. And they develop fractures in the rock. And so this is an example of what we call plucking. Plucking is a process by which individual jointed bedrock units can be pulled out of the river channel uh, during high flood events uh, in order to create channel erosion or incision over time. And so when you have a rock like this that has preferential uh, joints that are oriented, you see a joint here that has not yet been exploited. And so we have this, this bedrock joint is, you know, maybe will be picked up by the next flood event, but it hasn't been picked up yet. Uh, this, this guy's ready to go, but he hasn't quite, you know, been weathered enough uh, or there hasn't been a big enough flood yet to be able to pluck or entrain this particular rock unit out of the bed, but eventually it'll break down a little bit, maybe get a little bit smaller in size and there'll be a large enough flood that can take these, these individual bedrock units out. But the fact that they're fractured along this direction makes it likely that the river will orient itself in this way. At least that's a, that's a reasonable hypothesis. So this is what you see at small scales is that the vertically oriented joints that are, that are parallel and perpendicular to the extension direction, they provide zones of weakness that can be taken advantage of by the water and the sediment to erode preferentially along those directions. This is just one example of many. But if you take a look out, this is a, a LIDAR shaded relief image of Soldier Canyon. And um, the photograph I just showed you is taken from sort of the upper right hand corner. What we're seeing here is that Soldier Canyon through this reach is undergoing 90 degree turns. Basically there's a big 90 degree turn here. Uh, north is, is up in this image. Um, and so this is a this is a portion. I hope you see my cursor. This is a portion of the river channel that's oriented uh, oriented west southwest. So this is just along that extension direction. This is exploiting weaknesses in the rock that are oriented along that extension direction. There's a 90 degree turn, and then the river basically goes you know 90 degrees with respect to that. So this is perpendicular to the extension direction. Um, as it does so, it widens out, it actually dumps some of its sediment, it's not necessarily moving along bedrock anymore, and then as it moves back 
uh, parallel to the extension direction, it gets steeper again. And it's, 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 uh, but it, in, 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 in all these cases, basically, this is a pretty tight relationship between the, the orientations of the river and the direction of extension. So the hypothesis that bedrock joints play a role in this can be tested by going out with a Brunton compass and you can measure the, the orientations of these joints. And so this is a rose diagram, or it's a diagram that shows the, the frequency, the number of different uh, measurements that are taken with a Brunton compass along different directions. And so basically this is trying to show that in this portion of the Catalina Mountains, there's a there's a, a preference for joints to form, vertically oriented joints to form in certain directions, both parallel and perpendicular to that extension direction. And the river channels will go back and forth 90 degrees between these two preferential directions. That doesn't prove necessarily that the joints are what's at play here, but it does indicate that there's a correlation between the two. Um, now you can test this hypothesis a little bit better by going to places where the joint directions vary. They're not, they don't follow because of local effects like tilting and folding. Then there are places where the joint directions don't, don't follow the extension direction one-to-one. -one. And in those places, the river channels follow the joints. They don't follow the regional extension direction. So that's a pretty good line of evidence to suggest that the joints are playing a pretty dominant role in controlling the orientations of these river channels. Um, the second thing that I think plays a role has to do with the banding of the rocks. So as you bike up the Catalinas, um, or drive up, but I, I prefer to bike up if I can, um, you will encounter these metamorphic bands. So this is the nature of the rock. It has a relatively resistant, um, lighter colored band. And this is true, not of all sky islands, but it's certainly true of the Penelanos, the Catalina Rincon complex, and several others in Southern Arizona that are Nisic in composition. They have these relatively um, resistant, lighter colored bands that are intruded into an older granitic bedrock that is darker colored. Now this darker colored stuff is more heavily jointed. It has a mineralogy that lends itself to being weathered and broken up more easily. And so there's a couple of different mechanisms by which the lighter colored rock tends to withstand weathering and erosion better. So if you can imagine, basically, this is this banding starts off primarily as a horizontal process. You have horizontally horizontal bands of more resistant rock, less resistant rock, more resistant rock, and it's like a sandwich, you know? So there are these alternating bands. Some of them are very thick. These ones, of course, are pretty small. Some of them are centimeter in, in, centimeter in scale. Some of them are more like a meter in scale. But if you look at the entire Catalinas, there are resistant light colored bands that are tens of meters in thickness. And those can play a pretty significant role. What you have to do is you have to tilt the rock a little bit and you need to expose one of these bands sort of vertically in order to get this, this process to form. But what I'm gonna propose is that Pontotoc Ridge, which some of you may be familiar with, there's a nice trail that goes up Pontotoc Ridge, is basically a ridge that is created by the exposure of one of these thick resistant light colored bands. So Pontotoc Ridge is this guy here that's being pointed out by the arrow, and you can see it from afar. It's basically this light colored rock that has darker colored rocks on either side. You can't see them as well because they're, they've eroded away to a large extent, and you're left with sort of sediment, talus sediment that's been deposited on top of it. Uh, but underneath, you dig holes, you see that there's darker colored rock underneath this material, and you're left behind, or this ridge is being effectively held up high because it's this more resistant rock. So this is an example of a band, a resistant band that is that is holding up the mountain in some basic fundamental way, um, and is is resisting the erosion um, because it's it's it it because it has different mineralogical composition and because it has fewer joints in it. So I think what's happening is that these river channels, this is another example here, where they tend to be oriented along that extension direction. It's an example of both the preferential uh, taking advantage of or exploitation of small scale bedrock joints um, that cause the river to flow in certain directions because that's the easiest place for the river to carve down. And then at the same time, 
the exposure uh, of these of these these more weatherable bands provides zones of weakness at a larger spatial scale that can be exploited by uh, by these rivers, which ultimately want to get down to the lowest possible elevation. That's their job. Rivers want to carve down to the base level, which in this case is the Tucson Basin. And to the extent that they have resistant rocks to carve through, they'll do it more slowly. And that leaves high points in the landscape like Pontotoc Ridge. So I want to shift gears a little bit <clears throat> and talk about um, the nature of Sky Islands and, um, and, and what, how they vary as a function of elevation. So what I've tried to do in the first part of this talk is just sort of talk about how elevation is created and then how some of the heterogeneity in the rock influences the shapes that we see, in particular, the orientations of the river channels. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit more about the hill slopes and, and, um, and the vegetation and the soils on those hill slopes and how they vary as you go up a mountain in, a, in an individual sky island. So this is an example of the, the Pinaleno Mountains. Um, this is an example of, um, that, that, is, that is sort of characteristic of, of other, other areas. As you go from lower elevations and middle elevations, you go from um, hill slopes that have a relatively low vegetation cover or low biomass. So just the total amount of carbon in the soils and on the landscape is relatively low. Of course, the vegetation type varies too, and you guys can speak to this better than I can, I'm sure. But I just think about this in terms of biomass. If biomass is low, then that's, that's sort of important for me in terms of how I think about geomorphology. So down here, we have low biomass on the landscape. We have thin or no soils. We have short, steep hill slopes. Short meaning that distance from the divide down to that first channel can be maybe tens of meters. And so these are things that correlate low biomass, thin soils, and the shapes of the hill slopes being both short and steep. These are characteristic of areas that are more arid and are at low elevations within the sky islands or maybe away from the sky islands. Once you get to the higher elevations that are more characteristic of, of what we think of as sky islands, you have higher biomass, you have thicker soils, you have um, longer and generally less steep hill slopes. And this is a particularly dramatic example in the Pinaleños. You have this really like gently rolling topography up on top. It's really distinctly different from what's happening below. And there's a couple of reasons why this might be, this, this, this landscape change might occur as a function of elevation. So one reason that has been proposed, and I think plays some role, is that this might just be a portion of the landscape that hasn't felt the erosion yet. So when you uplift a terrain and through this process that we described, which started around 35 million years ago, the erosion starts at the mountain front first, and it propagates like a wave up through the landscape. And so that wave can take tens of millions of years to reach the top of the mountain. And so it, it's possible that this landscape just has been, hasn't felt yet the implications of all of the steepening that has occurred because of this extension. So we sort of think about this as a relic landscape. It's a landscape that had, was formed at a lower elevation and hasn't yet felt the, the response of all this tectonic uplift yet, even though 35 million years is a decent chunk of time. Um, the other possibility is that the tectonics has been felt up here, but because of processes and feedbacks between climate or among climate, vegetation, soil development, and landscape processes, we've actually created a pretty gently rolling topography up here for, for a variety of mechanisms. And so I want to emphasize those feedbacks because I think they can help us understand what's happening at the higher elevations of the, the sky islands, whether or not that's the only process is not, not critical. So what I'm going to describe are interactions and feedbacks among climate, soil, vegetation, and the hill slope shape. Now, this is a, a graph that was made from data from the Catalina Mountains, um, but other places like the Pinaleños have a similar type of correlation among different variables. And so there's a lot here, and, and I'm a computer modeler at heart, so I like to model every, every pattern that I see. Um, on the left-hand side, I've got some sort of really clean looking graphs. Those are the computer models. And then on the right hand side, I have the more messy looking things. That's the real data, right? So on the, on the x-axis, I have elevation. So down here uh, on, the, on the lower left hand side, this is the Tucson Basin, right about 850 meters above sea level. And then as you get to the top of the, the Pinaleños, 
uh, you're, you're at, you know, you're, you're at about three kilometers elevation. Okay. So we're looking at about two kilometers of elevation difference along this X axis. And here, I'm just trying to show that it's a bunch of things that correlate with elevation as you go up the sky islands from the lower elevations, to the higher elevations, the soils get from very thin, like down, down to about a decimeter or less. And there, it's, of course, it's highly variable. So this is basically an average soil thickness over many measurements. Uh, the soils go from very thin to almost a meter. So they increase in thickness by at least a factor of five or more. Um, the vegetation increases dramatically. So we use LIDAR to measure the, the, the canopy structure. This is basically a, an airplane that shoots laser beams down and we can determine the, the shape of the, the tree canopy in a lot of detail. And we can use that to infer the above ground biomass. That increases very dramatically. It increases, you know, basically once you get above about two kilometers, there's a huge increase. And this is basically the oak woodland to ponderosa pine transition. Uh, and eventually you get up into mixed conifer forests at the highest elevations. So soils are thickening, vegetation biomass is increasing. The hill slopes are lengthening too. And I'll give you an example of that in just a second. Um, the relief changes a little bit less. And the relief is just a fancy word for how steep are the hill slopes. And basically the relief is increasing, but then at the very highest elevations, it starts to go down again. So I'm just noting correlations among landscape variables and some of the things that might control landscape variables like soils and vegetation. These things are all interrelated. So I just wanna talk a little bit about, about how they might interrelate. So climate is really fundamentally the, 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 the driving factor, right? So when you think about how quickly rocks erode or how quickly rocks form soils, which you need to form a soil in order to get the gravitational processes and the flowing water to do its thing, you can have lots of flowing water. And if you just have bedrock at the surface, it's much harder to, to do erosion. So the soil production process is really the limiting factor for erosion. And so this is a recent paper that looks around the world and it's looking at the rate of soil production on the y-axis. And it's looking at menial precipitation on the, the x-axis. Now there's a lot of different rock types. There's a lot of other factors at play that control how fast rocks break down. And I could talk for hours and hours about that, but I won't bore you to tears. Here, I'm just trying to show that as you go to wetter climates, you definitely get more soil production, all else being equal. So the soils form faster and it's because water is a catalyst for all kinds of things that break down soil, chemical reactions, physical processes, also biological processes. So if you have more rainfall, you can generally support more vegetation and the roots will get down into the incipient, incipient cracks in the rock and they'll cause the, the, those fractures to open up over time. So there's a host of processes that are all driven by water availability. And so wetter climates, which we have at higher elevations in Southern Arizona, because as those air masses lift, they cool, the water condenses. And so there's that, there's that basic process whereby higher elevations give rise to, to a higher mean annual rainfall. So those processes are driving faster soil production. It's one of the reasons why you have thicker soils at higher elevations because soil is being produced faster. And there's a huge effect here. You can see that this is like a factor of, you know, about a thousand on the y-axis, okay? Um, as you go from very arid to subhumid to humid environments around the world. Um, now, thicker soils will mean more erosion. So one of the things that happens is that if you have soil on the landscape, the landscape can smooth at a faster rate. So one process by which erosion occurs is you just strip away the soil and just carry it gets carried away to the Sea of Cortez, you know, it's gone from the system. But another process of erosion happens on the hill slopes and it's more of a redistributive process. It's not as if the soil gets stripped away, which can happen certainly for sure, especially after fires. But a lot of the erosion that occurs is just the gophers and the trees basically churning the soil through biological activity and causing a little bit of displacement downslope over geologic time. And that, that, that disturbance process, what it does is it tends to smooth the landscape. If you don't have soil, then you can't really do that smoothing. So one of the reasons why we have a relatively smooth low relief landscape at the very top of the Pinaleños, which is the example I'm showing here, but it's also true of the Catalina Mountains, is because there's soil and that soil allows those soil redistributive processes to occur in conjunction with life 
to create a smoother, uh, more gently rolling landscape at higher elevations, which you wouldn't have in the absence of soils, thick soils. So there's a very direct relationship between thicker soils, which ultimately are driven by climate, and the smoother landscape you see at the highest elevations of the Sky Islands. Without soils, you can't smooth the landscape. With the soils, you can. So I tried to quantify this process some years ago. Distance to valley is just the length of the hill slope, basically. And so in, on the sides of the Pinaleños, where you have these very short, steep hill slopes, right? You get hill slopes that are 10 or 20 meters long. They're not very long before you hit that first, that first channel. But as you get to the top of the Pinaleños, you get up into two, 300 meter long hill slopes. These are really long hill slopes. It's just the distance from the divide down to that first channel. And it's a measure of how smooth the landscape has become, the length of those hill slopes. So this is one metric that relates to, to geomorphology, to the, the form of the landscape that relates to this, all these feedback processes that are occurring between climate, life, in particular vegetation cover, and soil development, and then the shape of the landscape. And of course, once you form these lower relief hill slopes, then it's easier to store the water. And if it's easier to store the water, then you can form more life. So that's why I describe this as a set of feedback processes. If you have more soil and the soil causes the landscape to become more gently rolling, and then you store more water, then you can form soil faster because you can, you know, for, for, for a host of different reasons, right? Water supports life and water facilitates the formation of soil. So both of those things can act in concert with the geomorphology. And so what this can do is can create very distinct zones, even though the elevation differences aren't all that much. You know, you get to the top of the Pinaleños, you have a very abrupt transition from steep soil deprived landscapes to much thicker soils. And that happens over a fairly narrow range. One of the reasons for that is all these feedback processes between soils, life, climate, and hill slope shape. <clears throat> now, elevation is not the only thing that matters. Of course, in mountains, um, you have steep slopes, steeper slopes in general that you have down in the basin floor. And those steeper slopes mean that you have microclimates. And so I know you guys are very familiar with this idea that <clears throat> basically they're the north facing slopes are equivalent to being at higher elevation. So this is a, a related to the orientation of the slope with respect to the sun. So the sun, of course, varies throughout, throughout the day and throughout the year in terms of its angle of incidence. But in general, if you're on a pole facing or here in the Northern hemisphere, a, a north facing slope, then you have a lot less solar radiation that's coming down on the landscape per unit area. Basically the solar radiation here is distributed over a much larger area. And what this means is that this climate zone, even though you're at the same elevation on the north and the south facing slopes, you have a very different climate. So the temperature doesn't vary that much, but the water availability of the soil moisture that can be uptaked by plants varies a lot. So you get these, you have a lot more water that hangs around in the landscape after rainstorms on the north facing slopes compared to these sun baked south facing slopes. And so a lot of interest has been, has, has, you know, exists in what is the role of this slope aspect difference on creating heterogeneity in the landscape, heterogeneity that can influence biodiversity among other things. So on the north facing slopes, it's basically equivalent to several hundred meters of elevation difference. So as you know, as you go to higher elevations, you get a wetter climate, all else being equal. In the south, and in in and so if you look at a north facing slope, particularly a steep one, you can get to equivalently much higher elevations, much wetter climates. And so what this does is it means that even at scales of a few hundred meters from one side of a ridge line to the other side of a ridge line, you have very different biological environments um, related to climate, but also related to all these other things that we've been talking about, like soil thickness and how soil thickness relates to the storage of water and how that relates to the availability, the carrying capacity for vegetation on the landscape. We have more vegetation typically on north facing slopes than we do on south facing slopes. And that influences the whole water cycle. So this heterogeneity at these smaller scales can create niches, environments for, for biodiversity to, 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 to be enhanced. So I actually don't know much about biodiversity. And uh, when, when Sarah asked me to come and speak, I, I just said, oh, just like, you know, create an abstract that says whatever, you know, like, and I'll, I'll talk about it. And it has to relate 
to geology in some way. But she did add this, this statement about biodiversity, which of course is central to what you do at the Sky Islands Alliance. But um, so I, I have like two slides that cover biodiversity because this is not an area that I know much about, but I tr I'm gonna try to relate in the last couple minutes here, um, sort of mountain building processes to biodiversity in some general way. It's not something I know much about and you guys can pick maybe during the question and answer session, you can tell me more about it, what you know. But basically my understanding is that moisture availability is important. So the fact that it's wetter at higher elevations means you can support more life in general and more life in general, just like in the, in the Amazon rainforest can contribute to greater biodiversity. If you just have more individuals of all kinds, then you can have more biodiversity through that, that effect alone. Um, also heterogeneity in mean, both space and time plays a role. So I've tried to emphasize in this slope aspect part of the talk in particular that at small scales, you can get very different climates on two opposing hill slopes because of this slope aspect effect that can occur at lower, lower elevations too, but it's more easily, it's more readily occurred at higher elevations because, um, because the slopes are steeper. So you can have more of a microclimatic difference between north and, and south facing slopes than you would down here in the Tucson basin. So that physical geographic diversity of micro, microclimate, slope steepness, soil characteristics, all these things that control environmental heterogeneity. If you're in a more heterogeneous environment, you're going to have more niches for, for speciation to occur and for individual you know, species to become adapted to those local, those local hotspots of one resource or another. Okay, so it's I think what's happening in these sky islands is a combination of just it being wetter and also being more geographic geographically diverse. So um, just a couple of slides on this again like I just pulled this up based on a Google search like you know a day ago right so take this with a grain of salt, but um, this is a meta analysis by Stein et al in 2014 and what they were looking at is they were looking at species species richness in animals um, globally. And they, and they were doing a meta-analysis, which just means that they weren't, they weren't doing their own analyses. They were basically scouring the literature, looking for, you know, in all these studies that have been done, what are the most important factors when you rank them? So one of the things they found was that topography was really important. It's actually the most important, together with vegetation cover, in creating species diversity, richness. Um, so, and what they're talking about here is topographic heterogeneity. They're talking about variability um, spatially in this case of topography is a major influencer on species richness across the world. Um, things like climate and soil characteristics were relatively lower, at least in this analysis. So this is just sort of one line of evidence that topographic heterogeneity of which you have more in mountains than you do down in, in the, you know, the, the oceans between the sky islands, uh, it's got, it seems to be important in driving higher uh, biodiversity. Uh, the second thing is this is an area of, of, of richness. And so people are trying to think about what it is about mountain building over a variety of timescales that gives rise to higher biodiversity. And so this is a recent paper, um, Rob Eck et al, 2019. And they were just, and I'm not gonna go into this in detail. I just, this is maybe just for future reading if you want. Um, I'm gonna take a look at this in more detail, but basically they're thinking, they have some conceptual models that they're proposing about how it is that, um, that heterogeneity and space and time plays out in mountains to drive greater biodiversity. And so one of those things, one of those sets of processes has to do with just the mountain building process itself and that how that can give rise to different biomes and different elevations, and then how that can give rise to isolated populations over time. And climate change plays a role in this too, because the, these mountains are variable in elevation. And as you cycle above and below, um, you know, different temperatures through glacial and interglacial climate changes over the last couple million years, you can drive a lot of temporal variability or heterogeneity that can also give rise to new species and new niches. So you're basically, these individuals are challenged in mountains in a way that they're not through heterogeneity that can give rise to both more, um, more, more, um, that they can give rise to newer species and also extinctions that make it possible for newer species to, to, to fill those niches uh, in an evolutionary process that over time gives rise to greater richness. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's my last slide. That was my attempt to relate biodiversity to, to mountain building processes. And thank you for your attention.
Awesome. Thank you, John. I did not mean to put you on the spot with that line about biodiversity. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I took it as a, it, yeah, it was, it was fun to look at something, you know, that wasn't like the, whatever, what's due tomorrow by the mind company. So thank you for giving me <laughs> an excuse to think about something different. I appreciate it. That's awesome. Yeah. So, okay. While folks are, are putting their uh, questions in the chat, I have a couple of them. Um, I just have a couple, I think they're mostly hypothetical. Okay. Uh, but so the first one is about the plucking of those large rocks in the channel as the process of, you know, channel development there. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious, what would the landscape have looked like without those large floods to move those rocks? Like, would it, do you think it would be the same landscape or do you think the presence of our monsoon and those large rain events uh, has really been important in forming these, these landscapes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what you see in these channels is that, so one of the ways to think about addressing the question you just posed is to look at places where the joint density of the bedrock is really low. So there are, th this is, a, this is a, a part of the landscape that's exposed because it has those lighter, those lighter bands. This is one of those lighter bands that the river is having a hard time getting through. Um, and, but there are other areas where the joint density is really even lower than that. And what the river does in those cases, it creates slot canyons, very narrow. And I mean like less than a meter, very narrow slot canyons. And it switches to another erosional process called abrasion. And in that process, the sand that, you know, you can see in the foreground here gets picked up and it's basically sandblasting the sidewalls of a very narrow slot. And so you can see this in, uh, you know, if, if, if you ever hiked Molino Canyon, for example, it's going back and forth between examples of the channel like this, which are plucking dominated, and then much narrower um, slot canyons, basically, that are, that are carved by abrasion. So I think if we had smaller storms in the absence of the monsoon, um, it's analogous to what would happen if the, um, if the joint density was lower and so the blocks were bigger and in that and we do have examples of that and what the river does is it switches to a process where it needs a lot more steepness it, it needs to narrow down substantially to focus the water in the sand and carve straight down so i think we would have a landscape in the absence of the storms that we see that um, to some extent would be steeper it would have narrower channels and those narrower channels would um, would be governed by a different set of processes, including this abrasion process. Very cool. Thank you. Um, awesome. So we have a while we're talking about erosion, we have a question that came in about some of the conservation tools that we use using small scale erosion control measures to kind of protect landscapes, especially post fire um, uh, mm -hmm. from from that erosion. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about the kind of adv any advice you would give about um, about us protecting some of these drainages from post-fire erosion in particular. Um, so I think that would be uh, something that would be great to talk about as well. Yeah, I'd like to hear more. And I, I'm sure that there's there's you know publications I can look at from your from your um, from your organization about what those the nature of those erosion control structures. I'm a little bit more familiar with you know what the bear teams do after the fires. They go in, they try to reseed and things like that. And depending on the timing and depending on the intensity of the burns, um, the effect the, uh, the effectiveness of that is mixed. You know, it depends on where you are, but the bear teams are basically trying to create vegetation as quickly as possible to grow up, um, you know, after the fires to prevent some of that hydrophobicity that can lead to flash flooding and that can lead to uh, the absence of vegetation roots that, you know, uh, without which, you know, there's can be very high erosion rates, as, as you know. Um, so I think that, you know, given how important the soil is for a biodiversity of all kinds, I think, you know, anything that you can do to try to keep the soil um, there, uh, and even if it comes off the hill slopes and does become part of the channel system, keeping it within the channel, you know, maybe that's, that's one of the things that you try to do is even if it's coming off the hill slope, it's sort of hard to control that. But keeping it in, in small check dams and things like that can be, can be quite effective. Um, you know, we do have a very flashy system, you know, hydrologically. And so, um, you know, I have seen examples before where erosion control structures were just taken out. And so they had a short-term benefit, but not necessarily a longer-term benefit. Um, and I'd love to chat with you more. I know there's a lot of people who, who work on this. Um, Mary Nichols is a friend of mine. She works for the USDA and she works quite a lot on these erosion control structures in places where she and I have overlapped in terms of our research. 
And so um, I, anyway, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would defer to, to Mary on, on her expertise for sure. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Um, we, I had a question that was sent just to me about, um, about mountains that have sedimentary rocks still at the top. So they haven't, um, had that, that just the metamorphic, uh, rocks exposed there. So for example, the whetstones and the Huachucas are two that come to mind. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those as well. Yeah. Um, right. So, um, yeah, basically um, the the sedimentary. So basically, when you start that process, right, this these shallow sedimentary rocks, you can imagine. So so here I'm showing a a normal fault that you know goes all the way from one side to another. But if you were to extend this uh, extend this uh, conceptual image a little bit over, of course, you would see some shallow sedimentary rocks that are at the top of this range. And so there are ranges where because the erosion rates were a little bit lower, and that could have in part been and, or just maybe the mountain range was a little bit wider, you may have had a situation where those sedimentary rocks have been preserved. And um, so that's, that's one mechanism by which you see sedimentary rocks at high elevations is that you're exposing deep metamorphic rocks on the steep sloping sides of the mountains, but you can preserve this sort of, you know, these sort of relic landscapes can be up top and those will be dominated by sedimentary rocks. And I don't know the geology of, of this area well enough to be able to say, you know, which mountain ranges have the best preservation of these older sedimentary rocks. Um, but I can, I can tell you that almost all mountain ranges in Southern Arizona, including the Catalinas, have vestiges of those sedimentary rocks at high, high eleva elevations. Uh, the Pinaleno Mountains may not, they may be entirely metamorphic in, in nature, but certainly the Catalinas have some, some sedimentary rocks. You also do see some sedimentary rocks. Another good place to see them is right along the edge of the mountain front here. So the basin floor will have the thickest sediments, but if you go right along, you know, if you go maybe a few hundred meters from the, 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 from the normal fault where it's exposed at the surface, a good place to see this is the Suar National Park East. They've got some older sedimentary rocks, some of which have been metamorphosed, but they're sedimentary in origin. They've just been pressurized, you know, so that we call them metamorphic, but they're originally sedimentary. There's some nice sedimentary rocks of, of great age that are formed right along the base here. And it's just because they're, they're you know, they, uh, the sediments bypass them in some way to fill up areas further downstream. So we see some really nice exposure of old sedimentary rocks, not only up high through the, the fact that the mountain ranges may just, you know, have had low erosion rates up at top, but also right along the edges here is another good place to find older sedimentary rocks in belts that parallel the mountain front um, and that, you know, basically are just they're, they're sitting down on the hanging wall by a few hundred meters or maybe as much as a kilometer. Once you get deeper in the basin, they're gone. They're all filled up. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah actually, so I'm glad we're on the slide because we did have also some quick questions about those compressive forces. And so from what it sounded like, if rock is being stretched in one direction, it's getting squished in the other direction just because of the features of the rock. Mm -hmm. Is that also true for those chunks of sedimentary rock that are left over? And do you see that same kind of channelization, those rivers, that kind of thing? Um, on those relic landscapes or do those behave differently? That's a good question. Yeah, um, I would say that I think the sedimentary rocks do not experience as much compressive forces in part because some of this compression is allowed to occur. Some of this compression occurs at depth. So I'm sort of showing these arrows on the landscape of today where the rocks are at the surface, but a lot of this joint formation occurs not at the surface, it occurs deeper down. So like this part of the slide down here, that's, that's buried. Um, when there's some overburden pressure that is allowing all this pressure to, to be accommodated. When you, don't have, when you don't have any overburden with rocks and sediments sitting up on top of them, then you, you allow basically some of the pressure that might be horizontally directed to be released in another way. So I'm not explaining this particularly well, but I think the sedimentary rocks that are, that are by definition near the surface, um, at least the, you know, the top of this pile is, is, you know, is the surface. Uh, those do not experience as much compressive stresses as these rocks do, because a lot of that jointing actually occurs deeper down at one to two kilometers. It's not occurring super, super deep. It's not 10 or 20 kilometers because you can't, you, the rock isn't brittle down that deep, 
but within the top few kilometers, it is brittle, it's going to fracture, and it has enough pressure from overlying rocks to, to maintain those compressive stresses. At the surface, you do not have as much compressive stress. The other reason why you don't see as much um, of those linear um, parallel drainages on the sedimentary rocks is that there's just not much drainage in them. Like there, you know, where you see sedimentary rocks sitting in the hanging wall, it's like a few hundred meters in each direction. There are little isolated pockets, you know? So I don't know of any, well, no, I know of a couple of examples now that I think about it where you see that preferential orientation, but it's just not, not as much expressed because there's just not that many rocks to, to point to. Gotcha, awesome. Well, I actually have one last hypothetical if you don't mind. No, um, so no. this whole landscape, it sounds like really started to form 40 million, you know, in the last 35, 40 million years. What does the next 40 million years look like? In 40 million years, is there still a Sky Island region? Is that something you can speculate on wildly? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, let's see, um, I, I would think so. So um, in terms of the plate tectonic reorganization process, I think that um, you know it was 35 to 25. There was another phase of uplift that was not as large about 10 million years ago. And that created things like the pirate fault, which is on the Northwest side of the Catalinas. That was a higher angle normal fault system. It did not have nearly as much extension associated with it, maybe one tenth as much extension. Um, so there was this secondary phase of extension that occurred more recently, 10 million years ago is still a chunk of time, but, um, and that lasted for a few million years and then stopped. So it does appear as though the, the, the gravitational collapse process has reached a point where it's sort of happy and the, the rocks are in equilibrium with their buoyancy and all that. And so I think it's going to be a relatively stable system tectonically based on the fact that we now have a, you know, we have a, a well-developed mature strike slip fault in the form of the San Andreas and it's, you know, splinter faults uh, to the west of us. And so I think tectonically, you know, people, there's not major earthquakes in Arizona, some in Sonora, of course, but, um, you know, we're tectonically, we're pretty dead here. So I think the Skylands will, will survive. Uh, the forests, that's, that's another story, but just geologically speaking, I think the Skylands in another 40 million years are likely to be in the same place. Well, that's great. That means 40 million years of conservation actions. We, we get, started, <laughs> get started tomorrow. John, thank you so much. This has been an absolute delight and uh, just a wonderful exploration of the Sky Island region. I super appreciate it. And thank you to all of our guests for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Sky Islands, please visit our website. Emily just posted that link in the chat. And with that, uh, thank you again, John. I'd just like to wish everybody a wonderful day. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Bye-bye.